Welcome and thank you for joining us for our program, Perspectives on Digital Security Policy in the Time of COVID-19. My name is Matt Nagamini and I'm the Manager of Strategic Partnerships at CLTC and will be the MC for today's webinar. I'll go ahead and turn it over to Ann Cleveland, the Executive Director at CLTC, to introduce today's speakers for our program. Thanks, Matt. And hi, everyone. Welcome and thank you so much for joining us today. The Center for Long-Term Cybersecurity was founded in 2015 with a mission to amplify the upside of the digital revolution by helping people address tomorrow's cybersecurity challenges. I can't think of two smarter, more insightful people to help us understand these challenges and solutions than today's speakers. So it is my great pleasure to introduce Amit Elazari in conversation with Kristen Goodwin. Dr. Amit Elazari is the Director of Global Cybersecurity Policy at Intel Corporation. She earned her JSD at the UC Berkeley School of Law, where her research, which has been widely adopted by industry, focused on creating a standardized set of contracts for crowdsourced security programs such as bug bounties, fostering legal safe harbor and computer crime protections for ethical hackers. She is also a member of the CLTC External Advisory Committee and a lecturer at the UC Berkeley School of Information. Kristen Goodwin is Assistant General Counsel joining us from Microsoft, where she leads work on customer security and digital trust. Kristen runs the Digital Security Unit, which oversees Microsoft's efforts to use legal, technical, and operational means to disrupt nation state attacks as well as global cybersecurity law and compliance, election law and legal support for Microsoft's Defending Democracy Initiative, Microsoft's legal work for the government security program for information sharing and assurance with governments around the world. Kristen also spent many years as Microsoft's lead counsel for the Microsoft Security Response Center and provides counsel to the Microsoft Threat Intelligence Center on advanced security and operational issues. So with a special thanks to both of you for sharing your time and expertise, Amit, I will turn it over to you to kick off the conversation. Thank you so much, Anne. And let me just say how excited I am uh, to be here with you all and also to have Christine, who is really a mentor, a thought leader, an expert on all matters of, you know, security law and policy and digital uh, policy more generally to join us. Uh, and I'm sure, you know, our, audi our audience, the same as me, uh, can't wait uh, to learn from her expertise. And with that, uh, Christine, let me kick off the discussion. You know, you have such a vast uh, experience and background. Tell us a little bit about what you do at Microsoft your kind of passion and initiatives uh, for the last uh, years in Microsoft, and what drew you to that kind of uh, focus area? Sure, and, and thanks. It's, it's great to be with you virtually. Uh, I, I miss being at the, at the center in person, as I'm sure we all do at, at, at this time. Um, I've been in security and specifically in cybersecurity since uh, early, Early 2000, I guess, is the, is the best way to, to think about it. As an attorney, my journey began many, many years ago, actually in securities litigation, which I decided was really not for me. And as I was working on a commercial case, um, I had to do a lot of due diligence around security and, and found myself fascinated by it and um, really dug into the security of, of uh, the, the deal that I was working on and transferred that into an opportunity to go to work for MCI, the big telecommunications company at the time based in Washington, DC. And frankly, that decision saved my life because it got me out of a job on the 85th floor of Tower One of the World Trade Center in uh, 2000. And so uh, from that point on, there was really nothing else I wanted to do in my career but security. And so being in DC, uh, pre 9-11 already working the, the client I supported at the time uh, was a fellow named Vince Cerf who's at Google but is one of the, the founders of the internet and so uh, I at that time was his, his junior lawyer and we, we went all over DC helping to create the model strategy for cybersecurity and, and uh, working with the White House and thinking about the creation of the Department of Homeland Security and, and, and response and so um, 
there was just never any looking back and uh, and and there won't be I, I love being in security I love the fact that it's one of the only legal professions we call a community and we mean it um, at Microsoft I, I've been here uh, for about 14 or so years uh, first in DC out here in Redmond since uh, 2008 and I focus on uh, anything and everything security. So I'll advise the, the, the business lawyers when they need help. I'll work with our advanced clients on some of the more complex issues that we have. Um, and when there's a, a, an advanced actor or nation state, that's when the fun really starts. And uh, I and my team get involved and try to think about what are the tools that we have operationally, legally, technically, politically to go help protect people. And it's a, it's a great feeling to get to do that every day. So yeah. That's me. Absolutely. You know, I cannot agree more. It's such a great time to do security uh, policy uh, and, you know, working for foundational companies like Intel and companies like Microsoft that are really at the front end of, you know, bringing that trusted foundation. Uh, it is first in mind. It is so important. So uh, it's just uh, a great area of digital policy to be operating in uh, right now. So with that, you know, as I mentioned, you know, and as coming across from your comments, you know, Microsoft, uh, uh, you know, a great collaborator of Intel, you are really in the front lines of, of the attack surface, right? You are a leading global player when it comes to prevention uh, efforts uh, as part of that. And, you know, I'm curious, you know, with COVID-19, with this big crisis that we are all dealing with, uh, uh, an unfortunate crisis, what are some of kind of the recent cyber attack trends you are seeing out there uh, across, you know, the various players in the ecosystem. So as a, as a Microsofty, why don't we say it with PowerPoint? And so uh, if, if uh, one of your colleagues here could share a couple of slides and we could just jump right into the next slide and this will be pretty quick um, just to do some level setting. So really what, what we're seeing at the top tier level is, is that nation state attacks are not increasing significantly due to COVID, um, we're seeing a, a fairly steady state there. Um, those who are sending out malware and phishing campaigns are being opportunistic, modifying their tactics, and ransomware is really going after unpatched VPNs. And so if you go to the next slide, we can unpack that a little bit more. So we have seen a small number of nation state actors that have used COVID uh, as a part of an operation. Uh, most of that coming from Asia and the Middle East, but again, this, it's a small number. Most of what we're seeing are either targeted or direct attacks that are going after uh, um, organizations or personal emails that are tied to those that are in the individual response, international response effort around COVID. And a lot of this is reconnaissance. You know, our, our view is that um, the attackers are trying to figure out uh, what do the experts and what are the response organizations seeing? What do they know? What are they doing in order to facilitate the, the knowledge of a particular adversary or country? Uh, and then in the crime space, a lot of this is opportunistic. So it's, it's changing tactics to, to leverage COVID in order to increase the likelihood of an attack being effective. And so if you, if you jump to the next slide, we can talk a little bit more about that. So the, the first countries that really saw lures coming from COVID were, were China, Russia, and the United States. But we've seen, we've seen lures or COVID-themed attacks in every country on the planet. And attackers are, are leveraging a lot of malware. You know, I, I think the number's up above 85 different malware or crimeware families that are using these lures. Uh, we're seeing a lot of TrickBot, Emotet, you know, uh, there's a lot of aggressive rebranding of, of these lures. We were seeing about 80,000 uh, COVID-related malicious attachments daily. That's starting to drop. But the, the most important piece here, and I think the thing that's really contextual for the conversation, is that this is still only 2% of the total volume of what we're seeing every day. And so, you know, yes, it's gaining a lot of attention, but it's, it is a very, very small number when you set that against attacks. And so I just wanted to show you a couple of, of examples of what these things look like. So on the next slide, you can see, here's an example of a spoof where the attacker is using WHO branding and you know, talking about cures to try to get somebody to click. That second example 
that's a really good one. That's a, that's a, a banking lure, uh, trying to get somebody to, to uh, uh, click because it's, it's COVID-19 uh, relief, financial relief, but it's, it's got a, you can see there's an attachment right in the middle of that email right there and, and click on that and that's what'll compromise you. On the next slide, there's two more examples. The, the first one's a little hard to see remotely, but that's a, an email that, that was targeted to tell someone that their financial assistance had been canceled, right? For, for a lot of, of people, if you're aiming that as a, as a consumer attack, that's going to have a high click rate because uh, if you're dependent upon that, then you're, you're really going to be concerned. And the last one really pulls on all the heartstrings, right? This is, this is an email that says staff member confirmed positive, right? So it's, it's triggering employees to think about their personal safety and it's got a malicious attachment designed to just uh, uh, infect people's machines with, with malware and ransomware. So, these are the types of things that we're seeing attackers doing. And if you go to the last slide, um, really the, the, the takeaways are that we, we saw a real spike of activity around this in April of 2020. What are they leveraging? A lot of unpacked VPNs. Uh, that, that's, a, that's a constant problem. Um, virtual desktops without multi-factor authentication. You know, that, that two-factor auth is a constant theme uh, regardless of COVID, and, and it should be here. And then this one, which is a little bit more specific to uh, COVID, misconfigured web servers running EHR, electronic health records software. So that's, that's really what we're seeing in the ransomware space of how those attacks are going on against hospitals. Um, and while there are always variations on the theme, these are the, the most consistent and, and uh, present ransomware uh, attack paths for hospitals. And we really think that the guidance that DHS issued uh, not that long ago is, which is available at the bottom, um, that's, that's really smart, smart ground floor guidance that, that, that should be adopted to help reduce ransomware threat risks. And uh, obviously we've got a whole bunch of uh, information available if anybody's interested as well on ransomware targeting healthcare if you, you're looking to, to, to dig down. But that's, that's just a high level overview of what we are seeing from an attack plane right now. And, um, you know, I, I, I often talk about uh, nation state and advanced attackers and the nation states will often be the ones that invest the time and the money to come up with a new attack. And then it sort of trickles down from there over time. And what we're really seeing are attackers that are being opportunistic. Why spend the money and the time to come up with something new when you can just recycle an attack or malware or ransomware that's working really well and be opportunistic about it? And, and that's really the theme of what we're seeing here. Yeah, I think that's the key point uh, that we are, are, we are really seeing, you know, uh, uh, not really noble methods, but rather uh, things that have been out there have been a problem for a while that we industry uh, and, and the public sector have been working collaboratively, uh, you know, with everything from innovations, right, and designs to public-private uh, partnership and information sharing to attempt to tackle together. So if we look at, you know, for example, the joint statement or the joint warning that came out of DHS with uh, the UK, uh, and CSC, again, they're talking about, you know, password, uh, you know, attacks, password spraying, you know, these are issues that, you know, we have been battling together for a while and having those resources available out there, having that proactive approach of the public sector, but both and industry, the information sharing, utilizing and reinforcing uh, what we have been, been doing, you know, that th there is an opportunity as well as an opportunity for innovation. So speaking about government, I mean, you raised uh, uh, the DHS response. Uh, let me let me ask, you know, as we are seeing this attack surface uh, uh, evolving, uh, how are governments responding? How is the U U.S. government responding? Uh, and what can we recommend for policymakers as they are considering uh, their response uh, uh, to COVID from a cyber uh, security perspective? Sure, and I'll, I'll focus really on the cyber perspective of, of what we're seeing. Um, 
From a, a Department of Homeland Security CISO perspective, uh, Director Chris Krebs and, and his team have really prioritized uh, information sharing and collaboration. And so uh, as, if you think about this as an incident, you know, from a cyber incident perspective, they've done a really great job actually getting people on the phone, making sure that we're all connected, uh, working collaboratively. And so that's a, a great model uh, and, and one that we support for any type of incident, including this one. I think what we were, we were seeing in the beginning of, of this transition from work from an academic or, or office environment to, to work from home was a concern that um, networks wouldn't be able to handle the shift. And that when you watch this migration of traffic and load from enterprise networks with VPNs and security to home, and, and what does that mean um, that there were going to be problems? And so government was, was, sh was shifting to prepare for that, but we haven't really seen that, that area of risk materialize. So what it's done is it, it's also enabled us to focus on uh, thinking about what are critical infrastructures and what are essential services. You know, we have some pretty clear laws and policies around how we deal with uh, protecting critical infrastructure or enabling, enabling essential services to be able to operate. But from a, uh, a cybersecurity and, and IT perspective, we don't have the same regimes and legal protections in place that exist for telecom, for example. And so I think it's going to spark conversations about how do we create more dynamic systems in the telecom world, there are laws and, and policies around uh, uh, if you need to, to make sure that a um, healthcare center gets more communication support, you can do that. In IT, we don't really have that. It's just that the industry surges to go meet the response. And so I, I think you'll see some normalization of how do we create a more flexible uh, prioritization, essential services of uh, uh, folks working in grocery stores or, or you know package delivery support um, what are the IT functions that are needed in, in order to enable that that those are, are newer essential services that, that DHS and others and other governments are going to have to think about and so that's where I think we'll start to see some evolution of how do we think about criticality and essential services yeah, I think you raise here some great points. I mean, uh, these are fundamental pillars of, of kind of principles we've been seeing across the security, uh, cybersecurity, and more broadly digital infrastructure uh, policy relating things like public private partnership, information sharing, uh, uh, which are so critical uh, specifically to security. And what is very clear is that uh, we are, again, in a point of time in the interaction between technology, law, and policy where the attack surface, the attackers, the technology, the challenges, and the digital infrastructure, the innovation, the technology itself, they are all rapidly evolving very fast. And the challenges are evolving fast. So to tackle those issues, uh, you know, we should reinforce and, and apply those kind of tool sets and uh, principles that we have. And you know, among others, these are principles like design neutrality. You know, we always had in mind that the laws sometimes they operate, you know, they, they evolve slower than the technology itself. So the, the notion of not baking in, into a, a legislation or regulation, uh, specific designs that might become outdated and having those principle based approaches that are flexible enough to allow us to deal with this evolving landscape on all fronts, right? On everything from the technology to the attack surface itself. Uh, all of those ideas that are not really uh, new to technology policy or uh, even to security, we have seen them on relays like IoT, which is another evolving right area in security. Yep. Uh, we, we can tap into those uh, resources, and, you know, the other piece of it is if we speak about, you know, all the public partners, partnership, uh, public private partnership work is the reliance on open standards and consensus based approaches, right? We have seen, for example, in IoT, how we look into, you know, things like minimum security baseline requirements, the work done by uh, uh, CSDE, C2, the work done at the NIST, at, uh, through NIST on the NIST or on baseline security requirements, those kind of consensus-driven uh, uh, 
efforts as well as standards are going to continue and play a, a key role because of kind of the evolving landscape. Um, so uh, with that, I mean, I think we've spoken a little bit on how the landscape is going to change. You definitely share some very interesting perspective. Uh, and I want to drill down on that and ask you specifically, you know, th this area of security policy, uh, we have seen many challenges throughout uh, the years, the decades, and also many evolving uh, kind of uh, uh, trends. What are some, some of the lessons, some of the lessons specifically from this area of, of cybersecurity law and policy, we can draw from, you know, past experience and apply them as we tackle this, you know, a uh, uh, very big crisis and try to think about the appropriate responses going forward more into the horizon. Sure, I, I think for Microsoft, we try to bring a principle based approach to how we think about uh, you know, the, the issue. So that way, as the circumstances shift, we can go back and check are our principles right because then then it can evolve but if the principles aren't right then it doesn't it doesn't move it isn't dynamic enough to, to manage and so as we think about uh what are the big tectonic shifts here the biggest is that that we have moved our our society's digital transformation forward in a massive way and and that's that's not just in the united states that's globally you know, school systems are online now in ways that would have taken 20 years of conversation to think about how do you how do you launch e-learning in the United States or, or around the world. And now it's happening. And so uh, as we're thinking about this, this massive digital transformation, we have to think about what are our standards and our approaches that that we have. So um, for example, we spent many, many years thinking about how do you protect your environment when uh, people want to bring their own cell phones or bring their own technology into an enterprise or, or a, an organization's environment? BYOD, right? Bring your own device was a big deal for a long time. And now we have the opposite. We've got TYOD, take, take your work device, right? Uh, anyways, so as you're bringing your work machines into your home environment, now enterprises and, and organizations have to think about is our confidential information protection schema flexible enough? Is our, uh, uh, our, our data protection regimes uh, uh, scalable for these types of environments? Are our, our baseline security requirements something that can be met through home networks? Uh, you know, do we have all the right technology in place to support the, those levels of security? And so it's, it's taking those, those principles and applying them into a distributed model because you know, I, I think it was yesterday we saw Jack Dorsey of Twitter declare that employees get to work from home forever, right? That, that's, that is a, a big change. And, and so as companies and organizations and enterprises think about um, the virtual of this, having those policies uh, in place will be essential. And I think to Amit's point, uh, standards are going to have to evolve to deal with that new distributed model. And we're going to see that across lots and lots of domains as they rethink how the, the effectiveness of, of these types of engagements from a distributed standpoint. Well, absolutely. I cannot agree, you know, agree more as we, you know, uh, the, the technology is uh, underlying, you know, every element uh, of our life. And that, that is a trend that is only going to continue and it, you know it brings about, about like huge opportunities and as we you know think about it uh, that security piece you know from cloud to edge you know from the foundational level of the stack uh, all the way up you know that that is definitely going to be key uh, and and innovation is going to play a key role in that uh, and the standards that we, we keep working on collaboratively uh, but also you know as we think about IT uh, modern you know modernizing the IT infrastructure the digitization and we have seen a lot of funding, uh, proposed funding going in bills uh, to that effect, uh, which is key, which is important because uh, technology is going to uh, uh, continue and play a critical role in our life, which is only going to expand. And we have seen that specifically with COVID. Uh, the issue of, you know, uh, uh, kind of considering on enhancing and, and ensuring the security, the resilience of the network from both a training perspective, and we have seen some great proposals, you know, uh, out there on that piece uh, from a, both uh, of enabling the R&D 
uh, an initiative that we need in to make sure that we uh, not have not just uh, not undermine the current innovations that we have and support the innovations that we have, but rather look into the future uh, to grow the innovative use of, of security uh, throughout the stack, uh, in hardware, in software, that is going to continue and be uh, important. So considering that security piece as we think about the funding that goes into uh, digitization uh, and uh, um, uh, basically modernizing the network. Well, that's a really great point, if I can interject there, because I, I think that um, we've spent so much time in, in society talking about the, the consumerization of IT, and I talked about the BYOD point, and now it's the shift. It's the enterprisation of, of our home life, and yet think of all the, the homes that don't have adequate broadband. Um, I, I think it's only because of a, a, a ban I imposed on all of my kids that I have stable bandwidth right now to have this conversation with you because uh, there's there's a no gaming uh, 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 ban in place right now in the house until we're done because we don't have sufficient bandwidth to enable four simultaneous video conferences and so for the research and development for the innovation that's going to come in this distributed model you're going to have to have more capacity into the home you're going to have to have access to higher computing resources from a distance. So the ability to, to collapse the, those, those concerns and make them more resilient and robust means that the quality of the environment and experience we expect from an enterprise, we will expect from our home environments. And I think that governments are going to have a lot of work to do to think about how do we help facilitate that type of, of quality in order to enable the sort of, of uh, uh, innovation that you're talking about, I mean. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we're going to see uh, more compute than ever, uh, and we're already seeing that, right, uh, uh, across, you know, the entire ecosystem uh, in the edge, uh, uh, you know, uh, in the remote settings. So uh, we are speaking about it from the policy perspective, but I think what's beautiful about, you know, this dialogue, and we have some, you know, uh, I haven't checked the poll results, but we do have some technologies uh, in the room, as we're going to continue uh, to think about it, that dialogue between the policymakers, uh, between the policymakers, between uh, uh, industry and the technical experts, and of course, you know, society at large, having that dialogue, uh, you know, that's going to be necessary for us to tackle collaboratively uh, kind of the challenges that are um, that we're going to face, right? Uh, and with that, uh, you know, speaking about dialogue, I think we've been speaking for a while, and to be honest, I can, I can, for me, you know, speaking with Christine, I always learn so much from her. Uh, for the benefit of, of the audience here, I had her, I, I believe, at least twice uh, in my class at Berkeley sharing her perspective and, you know, uh, the students uh, could not, you know, take enough of it and me too. Uh, but I do want to open it up, I think, for discussion uh, to, to have some kind of dialogue uh, to hear your questions at this point. Um, so let me uh, pass it along to Matt, uh, uh, if, if that's, uh, that's uh, what we have in store for right now, unless I'm mistaken. Uh, and uh, thank so much, Christine, for our comments until now. And let's open it up for discussion and hear your questions. That's great. Thank you so much, Amit and Kristen. I think now is when we would generally give a round of applause. Uh, but I will go ahead and give a clap and say thank you so much for the engaging discussion. Uh, we have some great questions, but I'll go ahead and get us started uh, with one of the pre-submitted questions. Um, Kristen and Amit, how do you view the connection tracking technologies that have been made popular in response to COVID-19 um, and specifically regarding the potential that they will continue to be used after the pandemic for purely surveillance purposes? I mean, and, and that's a great question, right? Because that's, that's something that Microsoft has been significantly concerned about. Um, I, am, I am not one of our, our, our privacy lawyers, obviously, but uh, one of my colleagues, Julie Brill, who runs our uh, our privacy practice, uh, recently released a, a blog, and I'll, I'll sort of channel um, what I said earlier, is that we look at this as, as needing a principled approach, right? That we think that, that activity in this area needs to have meaningful consent. It's got to be transparent. It's got to be collected only for public health purposes. It's got to be minimized. It, it, can't endure forever. It has to have appropriate safeguards in place. Um, and then it has to be deleted, that uh, there is a, a, a risk of data persistence or function persistence that would 
exceed its intended or agreed upon purpose. And those will be really important things to, to limit. And uh, uh, Julie's blog is, is available on, on our site if you're looking for more of the, the detail behind what we're thinking about it from a corporate standpoint. But uh, at a high level, it's, it's, it's essential that it not over function beyond the, 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 the intended purpose. Thank you so much, Christine, for sharing that. And I would just add, you know, um, uh, very briefly that, you know, um, and uh, again, I'm also not a privacy lawyer uh, at Intel, of course, uh, but what we're seeing more broadly, you know, as the digital technologies are really being deployed in the front lines, right, to combat, to combat the crisis and battle the virus, uh, we have seen this question of balancing user privacy with the usage of technology uh, considered uh, by many uh, policymakers uh, and other stakeholders. You know, and as we consider these new challenges and tackle them, you know, that as Christina Luden do, you know, thinking about the tools that we have, our collaborative dialogue between industry and policymakers using the existing pr principles that we just discussed, right, uh, uh, in terms of design neutrality and standards and all those uh, uh, tool sets that we have to work collaboratively to protect users uh, and their trust in technology from both a security and privacy perspective and there is an interaction between them, that is gonna be important. And just to add one piece, um, you know, innovations are actually also uh, probably gonna play a role in this as well. I mean, we, talk it, we talked about it in the security side, from a privacy side, innovative technologies like privacy preserving machine learning, PPML, uh, and really uh, cutting edge innovations that you're seeing in that relay will also probably uh, be utilized and play a role in supporting the data minimization practices. Thank you both. I'll jump into our second question. Um, COVID-19 related this or misinformation may impact the upcoming presidential election in the United States. As one of the world's largest private sector players in the cyber realm, Kristen, what is Microsoft's response to the potential impacts of such campaigns? Sure, you know, this is something we're heavily invested in. Uh, obviously, nation state cyber attacks uh, against the democratic process are something that we've been watching for a long time. Uh, back in October, we talked publicly about how we saw an attacker that we call phosphorus targeting a, 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 uh, an account associated with the presidential campaign. Um, that phosphorus attacker, we, we've, we've talked publicly about the fact that they're based out of Iran. Um, we, we, are, we are continuing to watch this space. COVID is another opportunistic uh, uh, vector that an attacker can use to try to gain access. Um, what, when we talk about uh, the election process from a security perspective, um, one of my colleagues inside the, the security team at Microsoft uh, looks at, at the four food groups of nation state attackers relative to, to elections and um, the, the campaigns themselves are one. Uh, think tanks are another. Um, the the uh, um, enterprises or, or, or uh, organizations are, are a third, and academia is the fourth, because you, you see so many people coming from the academic environment going into uh, the campaign space as advisors coming back out. Attackers know this. And they will target both the, your individual persona as well as your uh, official persona. And uh, the reconnaissance objectives are really no different than what we were talking about relative to COVID. So from an election security standpoint, what we advise is, uh, you know, I, I wish I had a, a magic cure-all, but it's, it's really um, many of the same things we talk about. Turn on multi-factor authentication everywhere. If you have a shared machine with others in your family, especially now in a work from home environment, really be careful that your information is, 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 is separated from those and that, that if you have a shared computer, that they're using uh, their own uh, uh, multi-factor authentication mechanisms. Uh, use a VPN, uh, make sure it's always on. The, the things that you can do to, to, to harden yourself and your persona will enable greater protection. You know, we have a, a, a service that we call Account Guard so that when we see someone involved in a campaign gets targeted or compromised by a nation state attacker, we'll notify them and we do that in something like almost 30 countries around the world. Right, so we, we are constantly looking at how are nation states evolving their TTPs, their tactics, their techniques, and their protocols. And then we like to talk about it so that we can help people just issue spot for themselves better. 
But if there's one thing that, that if, if any of you are involved in the, in the electoral process, I would encourage you to do, it's patch everything you have and turn on MFA. I guess that's two things, but, but those are the basics and, and uh, cyber hygiene matters significantly. I mean, this is the wash your hands and wear a mask of the cyber world. And so um, we could, we could I'd spend fill multiple hours talking about what we're doing on the election front, but those are some of the highlights. Yeah, Christine, Wonderful. I mean, Thank you, Christine. Uh, can I add on that quickly, Matt? I think, you know, Christine uh, raised some really key points, and I think the cyber hygiene and the usability, which means making those resources on cyber hygiene available to the population in various forms, in various level of expertise, accessible for users to be able to understand them, you know, that is, that is really the key piece because these are, a lot of the issues are not new. They are, they are, again, utilizing existing issues that we know exist there, and there are uh, resources available there. So, for example, Intel, as part of a remote learning effort uh, that we have put together uh, around the COVID, we made accessible a series of, you know, tips uh, and kind of ideas and kind of uh, recommendations uh, uh, on security and privacy for, uh, for educators and for students and for parents, uh, you know, in their remote learning environments. And I think, you know, we have seen definitely uh, a huge efforts from trade associations, from governments, from policymakers, and from the, from the tech industry, putting together those kind of resources available to the public. And I would just recommend, you know, this is, this is the time to really look at our cyber hygiene practices and ramp, ramp up on them. Wonderful. Uh, we will jump into our next question. Um, Amit and Kristen, can either of you share your thoughts on uh, the fight to end end-to-end -end encryption through recent Australian law and the Earn It Act here? I will briefly comment, and I, I will not uh, comment on specifically uh, the legislation proposed, but rather on the broader theme that we have seen, you know, on this issue of uh, encryption in the realm of cybersecurity policy. Uh, and again, this is a topic, you know, we have many academics uh, with us today uh, on the chat, and this is a topic that has been, you know, a debate, if you will, the encryption debates that have been unfolding for a number of decades, if you will. Uh, 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 Deirdre Mulligan, who is, I believe, uh, you know, a uh, very uh, prominent and key figure uh, in the School of Information has a lot of publication on it. So this is definitely uh, a debate that is, uh, uh, to some extent, is, is on in the headlines, but also uh, the, there is a history to that debate, if you will. And I think, you know, we have spoken today on, on some of the fundamental pillars uh, of security policy, like design neutrality. Uh, as we think about these issues, you know, encryption is obviously fundamental to the global economy. Uh, uh, generally speaking, you know, uh, insecurity, uh, we, we try to reinforce this idea that uh, there shouldn't be mandates on a specific design of technology that might uh, potentially undermine innovations. While we need to find, you know, collaborative paths uh, to work together uh, with industry and law enforcement and the applicable, you know, policy uh, uh, regulator or policymaker at hand uh, to tackle the issues. So I think, you know, those kind of principles will continue and, and be important as we continue uh, to tackle and to deal uh, uh, with this uh, particular uh, piece of, of encryption policy with the understanding that it really is a, a building block of the, of the global economy. Uh, and, you know, uh, we, we think about those issues as we basically design security for, for, for entire products. Uh, and, and these are really applicable, you know, worldwide and across the stack. Uh, so our principles uh, and the principles of design neutrality are going to continue and play probably a key role in that relay as well. Great. We have another question that was pre-submitted. Uh, what lessons can we learn from the COVID-19 about failures in forging a global consensus towards cybersecurity and privacy concerns? Interesting. You know, on a lot of levels, I point to COVID-19 as a, as a cyber success. You know what you're seeing a lot of companies doing, especially in the in the you know threat and, and intel space, is leaning into information sharing, trying to be collaborative, looking for uh, you know what new what what new uh, activities are going on uh, in order to uh, address and protect people. And so I think that 
uh, one of the things that the that the security community does really well is incident response. You know, we will pull together. We will focus on how do you come up with the collective uh, benefit and maximize protections and focus on uh, taking risks away from uh, those who are, are on the front lines fighting. You know, we, we took that account guard uh, service that we launched for, for elections a, a year and a half, two years ago and made it available for healthcare responders to help minimize the impact on them if they were getting hit by nation state attacks. And so it's, it's in large part been a, a, a pretty good success in how we collaborate. The, the challenge I think becomes, how do you deal with maintaining that um, up-tempo operational response over time? Because uh, for anybody that's worked in incident response, you know, 24 seven gets really draining now that we're in our, you know, third month of this, at, at least, you know, for, for those of us in Redmond we went home on, on the 5th of March. So um, maintaining that over time is going to ebb and flow. And so how we think about what is the new incident response state in, a, in, in this environment, um, that's going to be one of the challenges that we'll all have because governments will want to know as, as much as possible all the time and how we make sure that uh, we're not burning out our responders and we're maintaining vigilance and our ability to, to engage and respond, that's, that's going to be the, the, the big priority over the long haul. Yeah, and you know, I absolutely agree with Christine. You know, um, at Intel, we are a foundational company and you know, we work uh, on issues of code and vulnerability disclosure, sometimes with the entire ecosystem. Uh, and, uh, uh, this is really something, you know, we, we invest a lot of effort in, uh, 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 in the processes, uh, uh, and uh, it, it could require uh, uh, tremendous collaboration between the different eco ecosystem players from, you know, the OEMs to the CSPs to the virtualization partners uh, throughout the process to get that, you know, mitigation to the end users uh, in an effective manner. Uh, so as we think about, you know, uh, incident response, you know, this is an area in which uh, public-private partnership is key, international standards, best practices, industry best practices, uh, we certainly invest a lot of effort in that, uh, and building on the expertise that industry has in remediation, right? Uh, uh, increasing that partnership and, and having effective ways for information sharing that is productive, uh, in terms of, of you know, end users uh, uh, and, you know, just um, uh, raises uh, uh, patchability rates, you know, all of those considerations. Uh, I think that is, uh, you know, across, across the industry, across the ecosystem, uh, that is uh, something that will continue to be important. And we, we need to think about, you know, how can we, uh, you know, take the public-private uh, partnership to the, you know, to the horizon to deal with the challenges, uh, you know, funding that we are seeing going to things like ISAC, you know, information sharing, uh, 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 ecosystem collaborations, all of that is going to continue and be important. And we're also seeing, you know, uh, on security specifically, uh, policymakers being very innovative, you know, we just, uh, just today was announced, uh, uh, I believe, uh, you know, or, or soon to be announced, you know, CyberLeap, which is a specific bill that talks about utilizing challenges and, and competitions uh, 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 in the area of security to tackle with, you know, some of the most, uh, uh, um, you know, uh, key issues or recent issues we are seeing uh, in a way that is novel. So uh, I think we're going to see more novelties coming up. And I think, you know, that is something we should all collectively continue and consider it. We have time for one more question. Um, can you share your perspectives on how COVID-19 will impact the world's approach to 5G infrastructure? Particularly, what are some of the new barriers, success factors, and trends you think we will see across the geopolitical landscape as they pertain to the race uh, to be the leader in 5G infrastructure between the U.S. and China? A great question. Um, there's, there are obviously uh, uh, infrastructure plays that, that need to happen there, and there are, um, there are security and policy and legal plays that need to happen there. You know, when we think about uh, how COVID is going to impact 5G, what it's, what it's really shining a light on is was what I was talking about earlier with uh, the enterprisation of your home, right? When you're, when you're doing the function of your job, uh, from a, a distributed network and you're uh, 
um, hoping that your cable modem is going to cooperate or looking at your cell phone and your two bars of connectivity, desperately wishing for more. That's, that is the proof point that we're going to need to have more distributed capacity and that that will be the driver. So if anything, I think it will make it easier in the United States to have this conversation because we've proven it. I mean, we all have, we all knew, you know, we needed more capacity. Uh, we all need more, more uh, 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 bandwidth, but this has shown it. And so how we think about the technologies that we need in the United States in order to serve that, um, those technologies need to be built or acquired or, or transformed um, for the, the, the integration of different technologies. One of the things we'll have to think about is uh, do we have the adequate assurance models to make sure that we understand uh, what are the risks and threats of technologies that we're using and how do we, how do we close the gap? Software assurance is something that, that's long been understood. Hardware assurance uh, is, is also its own discipline. We're gonna have to start to, to, to rethink assurance in order to intersect those and, and have a, a more concrete conversation about what are the risks that we actually need to go fix in the United States. Is it the towers, is it stations, is it uh, uh, transferring back to your network, is it transmission, is it your, your endpoint? Um, all of that is, is going to, I, I think, be, be now pushed through the context of um, I can't get access from home. I can't work in a safe way and socially distance without it. And so I think that COVID will become the, uh, um, you know, this, this, my view, not, not Microsoft's. I haven't seen any of my 5G colleagues in a couple of weeks. I, I can't say that I validated with them, but my, my opinion is that um, this will be a catalyst to, to amplify that conversation in a whole new way. I mean, you may have different views, but, but that's how I see it. Yeah, I, I would just add, you know, in terms of what you're uh, sharing that, you know, uh, again, and I'm trying to kind of connect the pieces to our broader conversation. This is another area where the opportunity is huge. And, you know, the connectivity, the compute, uh, the benefits uh, that we're going to see with 5G uh, are just tremendous. Uh, uh, there is also an opportunity from the security perspective with things like network splicing uh, and otherwise. Uh, uh, I, would, I would just add that on that piece, you know, we talked about the standards, you know, things like ORAN, things like reliance on open standards uh, and having that kind of harmonized global approach because of the nature of the technology. I think those are principles that are just going to get reinforced specifically to that area. Uh, as we think about risk-based, you know, uh, 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 approaches that are going to be applicable and relevant to that station, to the assurance, uh, uh, all of those pieces, uh, and this is, you know, applicable uh, uh, to 5G, and this is also applicable to our broader conversation uh, around topics with respect to, you know, just the nature of the global supply chain when it comes to security. And we haven't spoken ex extensively about this idea of harmonization, but I think, you know, as we, again, looking, you know, broadly, not, not just specifically 5G, but rather broadly, broadly on the, that type of principle that we also have in security, it also interacts with incident response, right? It also interacts with IoT. Technology is global, right? Uh, uh, and it, it is operating on global scales. Uh, and that's where issues like standards and harmonization, avoiding fragmentation, uh, and having that, you know, uh, holistic uh, from both uh, technology across the stack, but also from an international perspective, that is uh, one of the key uh, principles that we have been seeing surfacing again and again in different conversations in different areas in the security policy realm. That'll wrap up our Q&A portion. And uh, I just want to turn it back to either or both of you for any closing thoughts you have as we wrap up. I will just wrap up with one takeaway. I think, you know, um, we, we have looked at things specifically. We have looked at things more generally. Um, you know, it, it is really uh, uh, an unfortunate crisis and, uh, and a, uh, you know, heartbreaking moment in time. Uh, but, uh, you know, uh, I, I think, you know, we are seeing today uh, things from technology, things from compute, touching, you know, each and every individual all over the world, uh, the role technology plays, uh, the opportunity uh, uh, for the future, for technology. Uh, and, and it is, uh, you know, unfortunate and it's, it's very sad, but uh, it's also very inspiring to see, you know, the joint response 
and to see how technology comes to play and play such a dominant role. So I think, you know, it was going to be up to us, people, uh, you know, operating this relay between policymakers, uh, uh, academics, uh, you know, uh, uh, the technical community, innovators to work really collab collaboratively to see how we can think about the specifics, but also go back to kind of the principles that we want to see uh, uh, play a role here as we tackle the issues, because there is going to be, you know, some emergent issues and also issues that we might want to be to, we want, might want to respond very quickly. Uh, so that's kind of, you know, holistic thinking. I'm going to, I think, you know, for me, that's the key takeaway. Uh, and maybe it's because I'm, you know, a former academic or some other reasons, uh, but um, it would be um, great to see, you know, just how we utilize that tool set and, and, and add more things into the tool set. And I, I don't know, Christine, I would love to hear your kind of one final takeaway for us as well. Yeah, I, I think we are at a real inflection point for how we want to deal with cyber attacks, right? So the security part, we know what to do and, and we all know what to do. And, and some of us choose you know, not to patch because it's not convenient or we've got legacy technology. Some of us choose not to use MFA or VPNs or to run service accounts without passwords. Like, some of us make those decisions, but I think that we also need to think differently about the attacker. And that's where I'm really hoping that we can use COVID to drive a change, that governments around the world decide, all right, you know, we're not gonna tolerate this level of uh, ransomware campaigns against hospitals, and we're gonna do something differently now in order to disrupt those. We're going to think differently about how do we use the instruments we have in law and technology and in policy and in the court of public opinion to, to call out attackers and to, to be asymmetric and different in how we respond because the traditional means of, um, of uh, you know, the cop shows of the 80s and 90s of, you know, you find your bad guy, you bring him in, you have the, the, you know, the law and order and the trial and you convict them, um, that doesn't work very well in, in the, the broad scheme of things, given the, the speed and the distributed nature of cyber attacks. And so I'm hoping the world will say enough is enough from a COVID perspective and try to think about bringing new asymmetric response capabilities yeah. to deal with a new set of threats. Yeah. And the collaboration with the security research ecosystem, right? So this is, totally. you know, uh, and, and spoke a little bit about my prior work in this area, but, you know, it is a, a community that is also very important, you know, uh, to my work at Intel. The collaboration with the security research ecosystem, with the ethical hacking, uh, the researchers doing tremendous work on, you know, uh, uh, including on offensive security work, uh, research, both in academia, both in industry, you know, having pathways to have that collaboration is going to continue and be, more important than ever as you know just the, the landscape is, is is evolving and and just the nature of compute and the nature of you know just having more and more connectivity and expansion of connectivity um so i think that that will also be a, a critical piece that we all are going to continue and work on so well, thank you yeah wear your mask patch your computer thanks well thank you so much amit and kristen i want to give uh you know a, a round of applause and a warm thank you again for the interesting and engaging discussion. Um, we always value our time with both of you and we appreciate you lending it to us. For those interested in staying connected with CLTC for future events or publications or otherwise, uh, please visit our website, uh, connect with us on social media or shoot us an email at the address on the shared slide. Um, we at CLTC would like to wish all of you and your close ones um, well during this time and we appreciate you joining the webinar today. So thank you so much and we look forward to staying in touch. Take care everyone.